Hello, I'm Keith Danikin with Apogee, which is part of Google Cloud Platform. This is a new series we're kicking off. We're, we're planning webcasts twice a month on various topics based on demand. So we're going to cover security, monetization, extensibility, and analytics and other topics. You can ask questions live and you can sign up for multiple webcasts. So a few people have asked me about how to do dynamic routing in Apogee Edge. So I'll be showing you an example of that today. This falls under security uh, and extensibility. So feel free to enter questions and I will answer them uh, at the end. So the agenda for today, a brief overview of Apogee Edge. We're gonna look at just the basics of how it works. Then I'm gonna go into the demo on dynamic routing, and then we'll do question and answer uh, at the end. So real quick, a overview of Apogee Edge so that we have some context for what we're going to see. This is our design philosophy for Apogee Edge. We've seen a repeated pattern of success with our customers. It's driven by how they think about the problem. It requires a shift in thinking. So traditionally, we think about this from an exposure point of view. We can just expose the service and we're finished. But thinking about it from the end user's point of view leads to a better result. Our successful customers start from the user, thinking about what that user's experience will be like and working backwards from there. Providing the application developer with great APIs reduces the complexity of creating new applications. The developer is free to focus on user experience and iterate on a few different designs. The API team makes this possible by providing easy-to-use APIs with consistent interfaces and security. And the API team builds an API facade on the existing services, abstracting away the complexities. Apogee Edge makes it easy for your API team to build great APIs. Apogee Edge also makes it easy for developers to consume those APIs. It also lets you measure every aspect of your API program. So let's talk about what's in Apogee Edge. It's a single platform with three conceptual parts. API services allows us to expose and manage a service as an API. Developer services provides a portal where application developers or API consumers can learn about your APIs and request access to them. And analytics services let you measure every aspect of your API program. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So API services is where we build our APIs. On the left, we've got applications, maybe a mobile application, a web application, or a partner system. These applications make API calls. They send HTTP requests. Apogee Edge lets you pass the request straight through to the backend system, or you can change anything in the headers, the URI, or the body. You can even do intelligent routing based on the caller. You can also manage the flow of traffic by imposing rate limits or quotas. You can apply caching. When the backend system returns a response, you can send that response straight to the application or change it as needed. For example, you might send a reduced payload to a mobile client or transform XML data to JSON format. After you build some great APIs, you want to make it easy for developers to discover them and start using them. The developer portal gives you a place to put your documentation and tools to let you develop your developers register for access. With smart docs, people can try out your APIs from the documentation. They can fill in data fields and see what a, a request and response flow will look like. The developer portal reduces the friction when getting started. So this is the one-stop shop for um, all your people who want to access your APIs. So after we built a few APIs and the application developers have discovered them and started to send traffic, it'd be great if you could measure the API program. The analytics system in Apogee Edge allows you to measure every aspect of your API traffic. So you can measure operational details like response time, frequency of different types of errors, things like that. You can find things that are interesting to your business, like where are people located uh, when they call your APIs, or which applications are sending the most traffic. Maybe it's interesting to see what type of client they're using. So let's talk about a common request that I hear from customers, dynamic routing. So here's the problem that we're gonna to solve today. So we've got different API consumers who should be routed to different backend services based on their relationship with the company. So we've got server A and server B there, and then we've got two different groups of people. It's a little bit more detail. There's an employee directory service. For people in HR, it shows more information about each employee. For everyone else, it shows basic information. So what are our goals? We wanna provide an API so application developers can use the employee directory service. You embed it any place they want to. Keep it as simple as possible and be able to report on usage. So the idea here is one API, one URL, and multiple targets on the backend systems. So everybody will connect to one URL that's in Apogee Edge. That will manage the flow of traffic. It'll put some rate limiting in there. It will automatically route them to the right location based on who they are. So how do we know who they are? How do we figure out um, who they are? To get there, we need to understand API products. API products are a concept in Apogee Edge that lets us uh, package up our APIs and deliver them to an audience. So here's the concepts here. In Apogee Edge, we've got this thing called uh, products. So products let us bundle access to one or more API proxies or specify resources within those proxies. Registering an application generates a set of credentials that provide access to one or more of those products. Both products and applications can have associated metadata, like a quota that specifies how many times an API can be called within a given period of time, for example. When a proxy is called with an API key or an OAuth token, 
the metadata is loaded and becomes variables in the proxy flow. I'm going to use that in the demo today. It can be used to make decisions about how to route the traffic, the kind of access that will be allowed, or maybe what to return to the caller. So the first step is to create an API product. An API product is used to package access to resources from one or more API proxies. The next step is to register an application. An API developer can do this in the Apigee Edge management interface, or an application developer might do it through self-service in the developer portal. From there, once we register that application, you get two keys. You get a consumer key and a secret. We use the consumer key as the API key. If you're doing OAuth, you'd use the consumer key and the secret in order to exchange that for a short-lived OAuth token. And these keys can have metadata associated with them, and we'll use that metadata for routing. So let's look at the API. What we're going to look at today is an example of an employee directory. So let me uh, jump into the demo now. So let's look at the backend services that we have. What I've got on the screen here is uh, this is the first URL, and this is the uh, general purpose API for employee directory. So you've got a URL up here. You can type somebody's name up here, uh, and it will show you people that match that. And in this case, we're getting the limited set of data that everybody gets. On the other one over here, um, same thing, same search capabilities, but in this case, we get more information about each employee. So two different URLs for the backend system. We'd like to add some security on here, some auditing on here. Um, I'd like to be able to put rate limiting on here so somebody doesn't call this too quickly. Maybe put some caching on there to improve the performance. So that's my goal. Um, I'd really like to put a facade on top of this and hide it away. Maybe we'll change the way this is implemented in the future. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to come over here to uh, Apigee Edge. And in this case, I'm going to play the role of the API developer. So what I'm doing in this case, I'm going to build an API uh, to act as a facade in front of my backend services. And it'll route me according to who I am. And I'll get into more details on exactly how that works. So a uh, quick tour if you haven't seen this before. This is Apigee Edge. This is where we go to build our APIs, to look at analytics, uh, really to do a lot of different things with the product. So um, you can do developing, publishing, analyzing. Major categories are listed over here. You can do different things. I might start with an API spec, or um, I might have a Swagger spec, or open API spec that describes my API proxy. That might be where I start. Or I might just start building things um, from scratch here in the API flows. I might have some shared flows, things that I want to reuse. So for example, when I create examples that uh, talk to Google Cloud, I have the authentication sequence stored as a shared flow. It's something that I use in a lot of different demos, so it's something worth repeating. So other things I might do in here, um, we'll see how we publish things later. We'll look at how we have things for apps and developers and products. Um, there's also developer portals where our consumers of APIs can come and read about them. So a lot of different things in there. There's some analytics. We'll look at some graphs and see how people would, uh, would call our API and, and we get data on exactly how it's working. But first, let's dig into exactly how the API works. So I'm going to click on API proxies over here. This will show me a list of my API proxies that I've built. So let's say I want to create one brand new. Uh, I would come into here, click plus API proxy. I'd build a reverse proxy, the most common. I might come into the next screen here. Example one. It would ask me for a proxy name. We're going to call this example one. I like to put a version number in my uh, URLs. And let's grab the URL that's up here, but without that on the end. Okay, let's go to the next screen. We've got a few options here for um, security. Do we want to use API keys, OAuth? Uh, do we want to put some quotas on there? Do we need cores um, to allow some cross-site scripting in there? Well, in this case, we're just going to turn off security and we'll do a straight pass through. Where do I want to deploy this? On the default server or on the secure server? I don't want anything on, you know, just plain HTTP. I want everything encrypted, so I'm going with just secure. And I'll put this in my test environment. Okay, now at this point, it's not doing anything very interesting. When we call this URL, it's simply sending the request back to this URL. The response is coming back to Apigee, and then sending that back to the uh, original caller. So we've got an empty palette here where we can put whatever we want to control how this thing's called. But at this point, it's not doing really anything. So if we click over here on develop, we'll see this in graphical terms. There's a request and a response flow on here. 
And that's the request coming in and the response coming back. So we can click in here. We can add a number of different policies. We have things for doing traffic management for quotas, limiting the number of calls within a specific period. Spike arrest uh, limits the number of the frequency we can call with. So we don't want somebody to call too quickly. Quote is a hard number of how many times you can call and spike arrest is more related to the rate that you're calling. Concurrent rate limit is something that we would put on a back end target so we can control how many connections are made to that. There's a lot of things around response caching. So um, one of the great things about this is you can put caching on here. And if you have somewhat static content, uh, you can make this much faster because we can cache responses. So full featured caching system, you can uh, pre-populate that cache. You can invalidate it programmatically, things like that. So a lot of different ways to work with the caching system. For security, um, a lot of different things around security. Uh, that's one of the main reasons people might have an API proxy is to help enhance security. So we may do things like um, basic authentication. I use this in this system. My backend system requires a username and password. So I'm going to use that policy to actually generate a header that I send to the backend. If we're working with JSON or XML, we might want to look at that and make sure that our fields, uh, the things that are sent in match certain patterns. Regular expression, same idea, but a little bit more open. There's a full, full implementation of OAuth in here. Uh, we've got verify API key down here. Access control lets us whitelist and blacklist IP ranges. We've got things for doing SAML assertions and for working with JWTs. Now, most of these policies that are in here, um, you know, so far, that's all security up there. Down here, we've got mediation. So mediation is something we would use for the facade pattern. We want to convert JSON to XML, for example, or XML to JSON. Maybe we've got a SOAP web service on the back end, but we want it to look like a little bit more modern JSON interface, JSON REST on the front end. With raise fault, we can do custom error messages. A great API should have good error messages that are going to guide us on exactly how it works and, and what we've done wrong. We offer monetization as a product add-on. So if you're doing monetization, uh, this would allow you to check some limits. XSLT and SOAP, these two you'll use a lot. A signed message lets us change the request or response or the headers in some way uh, in, any, in any kind of format that we need to. Extract variables lets us pull something out and store it in a variable. Then there's some key value map operations. These two uh, have to do with that. Now, most of those policies will do 95% um, of what you need to do. But at some point, you'll probably find that there's just something you can't do with those. That's where these extensions come in. We have Java callouts, Python, and JavaScript. So in those coding languages, you have complete access to the request and the response, and you can do whatever you need to to manipulate that request or response or put any kind of logic in there that you need to. Service call lets us call a URL before we hit the backend target. For example, um, I've got a demo where I do some geocoding. So if someone types in a street address, I call out to Google Maps, I look up the latitude and longitude and get that back, and then I send that to my backend server. Flow callout is how we would consume a shared flow. So if we have a flow that's common to multiple um, API proxies, we could put the code in there, and then we can reuse it that way. Statistics collector lets us save something for the analytics system, and message logging allows us to log something. So those are the built-in policies, plus um, you know, different extensions you can do and things like that. This is what we do is basically drop these in here uh, on the top and the bottom, and that's how we build up our API proxy. So let me jump back and show you the uh, example uh, that's been completed. It'll be a little bit more interesting. So back to the employee directory. Remember, we've got this service, returns things like this. You can put a name up there on the URL and search for things. This requires some authentication to get in. I was already authenticated uh, by the time you saw this. But what we're going to do in our API proxy here is we're going, to, um, we're going to manage the connections to this a little bit. We don't want people just calling those URLs. We want to dynamically route, make those two different URLs look like one. So let's see how we do that. Let me jump over to develop here, and I'll show you what I've built in here. So uh, the screen gets a lot more interesting at this point. So these are the policies that we've used. And if you click on them, you can see how, they're, uh, how they've been configured and things like that. Down here, we've got proxy endpoints. So the proxy endpoints is the Apogee part that sits in the middle here. And 
We've got a pre-flow and a post-flow, and then there's also other conditional flows that can be in there. I don't happen to have any conditional ones, but for example, we might have logic that's custom for when you call this with HTTP post, or when you call it with get or put or something like that. In this case, um, pre-flow is called first, any of those conditionals would be called, and then post-flow is called. So all my logic here is in pre-flow. And down here we've got targets. I have two different targets. I have two different backend systems. And then I have some rules in there on when it should go to one versus the other. So uh, let's go over this and then we'll talk about the target backends. So first thing I'm going to do when somebody calls my API is I've put this verify API key policy in here. So it's looking for in the request, it's looking for a query parameter called API key. And if it doesn't find that, or if the API key that's passed in is not valid, it's going to return back an unauthorized error and people don't get into the service. I've got a spike arrest on here. My spike arrest is set to 20 calls per minute. And if somebody calls at a rate faster than that, uh, then I'm not going to let them in. And then I've got a quota on here. And I've got different API products, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and depending on which product you're using, you can have a different quota on here. So different users would have different quotas. I might have a simple test um, product that I can let somebody use that gives them uh, maybe 100 calls a day or something like that. And then I might hand out different thresholds for different users within the company. So that's what this, this, this is what happens when anybody calls this. Uh, the next interesting thing to look at is the, uh, the back ends. So uh, these both look similar. They're for different backend servers. So if we come down here, we can see the URL for this one is this V1 public employees. And then the URL for this one is the V1 HR employees. So they're going to different places and we have different logic. This is a key value map. It's looking up the username and password for the backend server. So I've got a service account on there for HR users. I'm looking up the credentials and I've stored those in uh, the key value map with an Apogee Edge. And I'll pull them out uh, when, it, when this flow executes. And then I'll build a basic auth header in there. And that header is then inserted in there as if I've typed a username and password. That gets me into the backend system. So the other thing to look at in here is uh, I have some rules that determine which way I get routed. So these have different names. I have default and HR are the names of the two backend servers. Over here, we've got, uh, we've got the, when I click up here on default, we can see that uh, here's all the rules for things. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see that there's a routing rule. So this is how we do the dynamic routing that I was talking about. And it can be based on any kind of condition. And the condition can be any kind of you know, expression that you'd put in there. There's documentation on the expression language and what's supported, but it does the kinds of things you would expect. Uh, equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, comparisons, things like that. So in this case, I'm looking for a specific piece of metadata. I'm looking for a flag that says HR. And I'm looking for a variable called department. And if it's equal to HR, then I'm going to route to the HR server. And I do that by name. And then that'll match up with the URL that I've got stored down here. And for everything else, I call the default. So either you match HR or you don't. And that goes to the back end. Okay, so normally at this point in the demo, I would show how to trace something. So there's a nice utility up here called trace that lets us do some debugging. But I need an API key. I've got a policy in there that's checking for an API key. And it's also checking for some metadata on this API key. So in order to get an API key, I've got to publish my proxy first. So let's talk about that. And then we'll come back to trace. And uh, I'll show you exactly how you'd use a debugger in here. So let's say this is good. Let's say this is reasonable. And we want to push it out there and publish it. Um, we've got a few things to think about. If you remember from my slides, we have this concept called API products. And API products is how you put things to market. So you can develop these proxies in here, but there's a need to bundle them up in certain ways for different groups. There may be some overlap in, in who gets to see what, but, but we might want some specific metadata included in there. Like, for example, this keyword of department in here. So in order to publish, we're going to come up here to the uh, box icon up there. And we're going to look at, uh, there's apps, and there's API products, and there's portals. Let's start with API products. So this is where we build an API product. You can come in here, and uh, you can click API product. And it'll give you a whole wizard you can run through that asks you what sort of, uh, which APIs do you want in there? Are they public? Are they private? Um, things like that. But let's go back to uh, one I've already got working in here so that we can see that. So we've got employee directory. Uh, HR and public. Let's look at HR because it's got more information there. 
So what's included in here? Uh, let's look at edit so that we get a little more descriptive view of this. This is the employee directory. It's public. Uh, the key approval type is automatic. So um, when somebody requests an API key for this, should that just be handed to them automatically or is there an approval process for that? If we have an approval process, we'll put that over there on manual. The quota is 30 requests every one minute. And then um, we've got in here the employee directory API proxy. And then you can put any kind of custom attributes you want on here. So anybody who's using a key that's associated with this API product will have this attribute passed in, department equals HR. So that's how that got in there. That's where the HR variable came from. Any key, any metadata that's associated with an API key is populated as a variable um, when that key runs through the system. So this is how we published it. So we have products and then we have applications and applications give access to one or more products. The products give application, give access to one or more API proxies. So let's go look at the uh, actual applications we've got in here. So if I click over here on apps, we'll see that we've got employee directory, HR web. I might have mobile, I might have, um, you know, whatever happens to be being used, a web page access, you know, who knows what it is. So in this case, we have, um, we have the developer application in here. And uh, if I click on that, it would show the API key and the secret in there. And we would use that key that's passed on the URL that's gonna get us into uh, that backend. And it gives us access to this. You could put any custom attributes you want on here also. Um, you might have multiple apps for each proxy. But that's the application, and that's where I get that key. So um, let me grab this and then we'll do some debugging with it. Now there's a few ways we could debug this. Um, I wanna step back. We're gonna go back to developing our API proxy. Let me go over here. And I promised we'd run that debugger so we can look at that. So uh, we were here and then we were here. And now we're gonna go over to trace over here. And what I really wanted here was I wanted to be able to type um, name equals, let's say Smith and API key equals that. Uh, I forgot to turn that on. Let's turn that on. Uh, let's turn that on for the test version because that's what I'm hitting. Okay. So we're getting back a 200 key in there. Now, what's interesting to see is exactly what happens. It's showing a bunch of steps in here. And let me call this a few more times and we'll see if we can get it to uh, send us a spike arrest. I might not be hitting it quick enough. I've got my threshold set a little too high. So I'm not getting the error I wanted. But if we look at one of these, um, what we'll find in here is, uh, here's where it enters, less than one millisecond. That's where our API key is verified. So that key that's assigned to my application, uh, when this comes in, I can look at all, this, all the details down here. Notice it's the um, employee directory product. We know who the developer is. Um, we have a lot of information about that. We have um, the fact that the department name is equal to HR. So all those things that are on there, what the quota is, all this metadata, these all become variables. These are the variable names here. And you can have any kind of condition you want in here to execute logic conditionally based on that. This is our spike arrest. This is our quota check. And we didn't violate either of those, so it's going to uh, continue to allow us to get in. So uh, there it is when it gets sent to the back end. And then here's the response coming back. Looks like our back end um, took 47 milliseconds to process it. And then we see that come back out on the other end. So. Um, Let's come back over here to develop and let's turn down the threshold and, and see if we can break this a little bit. So uh, let's turn this down to 10 per minute because I think I can hit that. And we'll hit save on here. We'll restart our trace session, and we'll try this again. Okay, so there's the 429 error. That's the rate limiting, showing that um, I've been rate limited. Let me do this in the test so we can 
I actually see it show up over here. Okay, so let's send in a few more requests and, and see if we can get back some errors this time. So there's another one. I'll send a few in real fast. At some point, I expect it to return, yes, a 429 error. So what happened in that case was I was calling too quickly, and our spike arrest kicked in to prevent me from bringing down the back-end system. And so uh, we see that exclamation point show in there. And then I also have a custom error message in there. So I return a... Uh, very specific thing that says too many requests. So there's the body of the message. Call rate exceeded. This application is limited to 10 requests per minute. So that's giving somebody a, a good indication of why it broke. So that error message is really handy to have uh, because it really enhances the usability of our API proxy. So that's a basic example of how we might come through here and debug. We can see exactly what happens in this case. If somebody was complaining that they were getting an error message, we'd know exactly why. We go through the publishing process, as we saw in there, where you're going to create an API product. You're going to um, then create an application. And then we'd have our credentials. So that's the basics of how we'd publish something, how we debug it, and uh, get it working in here. So that's the role of the API developer to build these things out. Next thing to think about, though, is you know once the service is here, how do the developers find out about it? How do they know what it can do, um, what the URL is, how to get credentials, and things like that? That comes from a developer portal. So uh, you click over here, and we're going to click down here on developer portals. Now, unfortunately for this example, I didn't have time to build out a full developer portal for this particular um, HR directory example. But I do have one from a previous demo for my uh, weather history demo. You might have seen that out on, out on YouTube. So uh, the way this works, you come in here and you click on plus portal. You give it a name. And it'll give you a stock um, sample portal. And from there, you can customize it, change the theme around, add pages, and things like that. So let's look at a little bit of detail on how this works. So you have themes, change the CSS, change the logo, look and feel, add some pages to the menus, choose which APIs show up in here. So um, based on your API products and your uh, open API specs, that's going to determine which APIs show up in here. What kind of assets do you have in here? What images are there? What do you want on the menus? Custom strips, um, custom scripts, domain settings, um, things like that. So let's look at pages. I've got a few pages in here that describe my portal. Um, let's go back to uh, APIs. This is where I describe uh, what's, what's going to be in my portal. But uh, probably more interesting is, let's look at the finished portal. So we're playing a different role here. We're looking at this from the developer's point of view, imagine you're an a application developer and you don't necessarily have deep knowledge of those different backend systems. They may be managed by different people, but you have a need to write an application. You want to consume the employee directory or in this case, uh, weather data. So you come to this portal, you can look at what APIs are available. You can click on one and then you get some details. You get some um, idea of how to call these things. This gives us some examples in there. It tells us what kind of um, error messages we can expect and things like that. So I get a pretty good idea of how to use this API um, from reading this documentation. I can log in. I can create an account on here. And uh, I can request credentials. And then it would send me an API key. And I can start using this immediately. So the goal behind this portal is to make developers or API consumers completely self-sufficient. So they're going to do everything on here. And they can find everything they need. We want to reduce the friction it takes in order to get to that first application. So people will come in and experiment with our employee directory. They'll use it in a lot of different ways. We'll, we'll see interesting uses of it that we may never have thought of. So that's where the developer portal comes in. And that's, that's kind of a next phase within here. Other thing to look at is how would you measure everything? So we have analytics in here. Analytics gives us, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in this example, but we've got a ton of graphs in here. So sign up for a trial account and, and look through here and, and take a look at these. Uh, we can get an idea of the traffic that's coming through here, traffic by proxy. Um, we can look at, uh, let's click over here and get a little more detail on our reports. So we might look at um, what kind of devices are coming in. Are people calling from tablets? Are they using uh, mobile devices? Are they in Chrome? Are they in Firefox? We get an idea of, of um, how they're coming in and, and what they're doing. We can look at some error code analysis. 
What kind of errors are people typically seeing in here? Are they not understanding the documentation? Are they calling too quickly and getting quota errors or um, spike arrests and things like that? Where are they calling from? You know, what is the location of the of the different calls in there? You can zoom in a little bit here and um, and look at where things are coming from. We've got a data center running over there, and uh, I happen to be here in Colorado. So if we look at uh, go a little bit further, we'll see um, where my demo has been called from recently. We can look at latency analysis, give us an idea of how this is performing over time, and get a, a general idea for um, how exactly it's working. And this considers the 95th and 99th percentile. So that's going to filter out the ones that are doing just fine. You're just going to see the trouble cases in there. You can also build custom reports in here, and that's a great feature. You can grab anything from the request or the response and turn that into a custom report. So imagine you had access to all the traffic flowing between here. What would be interesting to measure? So kind of three major buckets to look at here. Um, we specifically dove into how to build a routing example in here that was based on a certain attribute that's attached to a key. So we built this employee directory API proxy in here that hides those two different backends, makes them look like one, and also manages connections to that. So we've put this, um, we've got a verified key on there. We've got a spike rest and a check quote. All those three things, those are just a few things we might want to put on there to protect our, um, our backend system. So we built that. We might have a basic portal in there that's going to give us information on how to use the APIs, and we might use analytics to monitor all of this. So think about how, the, how all these things would work together and how you could use those to build your very own API program. You know, this would certainly help you manage that, and it's much easier than you know, trying to create all this from scratch. So I showed you how Apigee Edge can help us build all these different APIs and let us manage a full API program, but where's the real benefit in that? You know, what does this really do for the company? How would you justify something like this? And, and why are APIs interesting in the first place? So imagine you're the application developer, you're the consumer of these APIs, and you have a need to create a new application. Someone's asked you to use this employee directory information and put it someplace. What I've got on the screen here is a, a simple example of that. Uh, so this is a single page web application. Uh, the HTML is over here. You know, not much in here. A lot of stuff to make the, uh, the results look nice in here, but um, nothing is happening on the server side. This is all HTML and then a simple call to that particular um, API. So if we uh, look at how this works, I'll type in uh, Smith in here. Let's say Smith uh, J and, and search. I get back my results right away like that. Or if I, uh, if I trim that down a little bit, I get back a few more names. Now I'm getting the full access in here. And, and just to show how this all works and you know, tie it all together, if I put in a different API key, I get different results in there. So I've effectively made this so that I've got personalized search in here, depending on which set of um, API products those keys are tied to, I get back different results. It's super easy to create an application like this. I could go embed this in the company internet webpage. I might share it with uh, different people who are doing customer service or something like that. A lot of different things you could do with this, but um, it's now super easy to consume this information uh, in a variety of different formats. So that's our big benefit behind having a nice API program. And of course, there'd be analytics to show how this is being used. Um, we could manage versioning of this information. We might switch out the implementation of that employee directory completely, but because we have this nice facade on top of it, it's not going to affect all these applications that might be consuming it. So it frees us up to really innovate, and it frees us up to be able to be more digital, to be um, more proactive to business needs. So that's the end of the demo section of the uh, webcast today. Uh, at this point, we'll open it up for question and answer. Okay, so a few questions came in. So um, someone asked, if I create an API, can someone from another group or organization modify the API? So there is role-based access control. So if we want to control what people can do, we can use that. There's a concept of organizations. So we can have different groupings of people using Apigee, maybe from different departments. They can have their own users, their own set of APIs and things like that. And you can control who sees what. And then underneath that is role-based access control, where some people might be able to do things in tests, but not in production and things like that. So you have complete control over what people are allowed to do and, and what they're not to. Uh, another question in here. So what about healthcare? So someone has asked, We'd like to learn more about Apigee API management with respect to healthcare and what's on the provider and hospital side and any relevant use cases we've seen with other clients. 
Apogee has a whole bunch of healthcare customers. So we have a HIPAA offering of this. If you, there, you know, this is, this is offered both in the cloud and on-premises. The cloud version is certified for HIPAA and we have all the compliance in place for that. Um, so we've got a, a bunch of different insurance companies and we've got quite a few people who have been interested in integrating this with their um, electronic medical record systems in order to um, have API access to that. Another question is, do we have a sample for an implicit grant? Uh, I don't have a sample in this webcast for that, but yeah, it is something that's easy to do. Um, and it's easy to, the same way that I generate these tokens, we can put some other logic in there to talk to other systems and different things like that. So another question, is this on-prem or is this cloud? What I showed in the demo today was, uh, I showed this in the cloud version of Apogee Edge, but there's also an on-premises version of it uh, that's the same software. So you can run in either case. So you can run it... Um, all in the cloud, you can run it all on premises. There's also a hybrid model where most of it's going to be in the cloud except the routing portions of it, and that would run locally um, using the micro gateway. So, another question was uh, this is an interesting example. Could the routing that was done in here be based on user information we get from Active Directory? So, a lot of times people want to tie into Active Directory because that's where their whole company LDAP is. So, yes, you can call out, and as long as you can get metadata into the system or, or use a, a Java callout or something like that, you can grab that information from anywhere. And as long as there's a variable, you can use that for routing the same way that I had the HR variable in here. Okay, I don't see any other questions at this time. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of a poll here and we'll see. I wanna ask about what other topics you guys would like to hear about on our next webinar. So security, monetization, personalized routing for your APIs, or, or really any other topics that you'd like. So take a minute to look at that and, and answer that. Okay, and one more poll question. Tell me what you think here, more technical, less technical, or just about right? So if you'd like to get some more hands-on experience with Apigee Edge, uh, there's going to be links to our virtual API Jam in the resources section. Uh, an API Jam is an opportunity for you to try the software hands-on. So what we do in that is you build a simple API proxy like you saw me demonstrate today. And we've got a whole lab guide that walks you through that. And the experience for this is really, uh, it always looks great when somebody else demos it, but it's great to try this out and, um, and see how it's going to work for your company and, and whether it works for you. So the next webcast in the series is on February 6th. Uh, take a look at that and sign up for it. We'll announce the topic a little bit before that, and uh, it'll be similar to this. We'll do a brief overview uh, and then dive into a demo on a, on a very specific topic. So thank you everyone very much for attending today, and we'll see you on the next webcast.